This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one website building tool. Gravity is a force of attraction between massive objects, right? But light is massless, so I always thought that it shouldn't be affected by gravity. But then I learned that the path of the light can be bent by very massive stars. So what's going on? Why is gravity affecting massless light? Now for a long time I thought Newton had no answer for this, but boy was I wrong. So in this video we're going to see first of all how even in Newtonian physics you can argue that gravity can affect light, but then we will see more importantly how this actually surfaces. A big mystery that was hiding for centuries, and finally how Einstein comes along, takes it to a whole new level, and will help us rediscover, that's right, it's a rediscovery, not just telling you the facts, but how we will rediscover the basic ideas of general relativity. This is the first of a video series on this. So if you're ready to dive deep into this, let's begin. So Newton, help me understand why gravity affects massless light. For that, Newton asks, Mahesh, first of all, what would happen if you were to drop a basketball and a feather in vacuum? Which one would fall first? Well, my answer would be obviously the basketball, the feather would just float over there. But Newton reminds us this is because of all the air particles present, in the, uh, present over there. What if we got rid of the air and did this in perfect vacuum? Then we'll actually find that the basketball and the feather actually fall together. And we've done these experiments multiple times before and I've linked below two of my favorite sources. One is in a NASA facility where you actually drop a basketball and a feather in a giant vacuum chamber. And there's another epic video of, well, a hammer and a feather being dropped on the moon. So check them out. The link is in the description below if you haven't seen it already. But this basically means that both the basketball and the feather accelerate down at the same rate, the familiar 9.8 meters per second square. But more importantly, these two have different masses and still they accelerate down at the same rate. This means this acceleration is independent of mass. And now Newton asks Mahesh, what if we consider even a lighter particle, say a grain of sand, what would it accelerate at? And I'm like, yes, I got it. Even that should accelerate at 9.8 meters a second square near Earth because it's mass independent. And now Newton asks, Mahesh, what if we consider even lighter particles, say a virus? And I'm like, okay, it's very hard to visualize a virus accelerating down, but it should. It should also accelerate down at 9.8 meters per second square because we have established this, Newton. What's your question? What's your point? Why do you keep asking me this question? And now Newton asks Mahesh, what if you now consider the lightest particle, light? What happens to it? No, this cannot apply to light. <laughs> And Newton says, but why not? We just saw that this acceleration is independent of the mass. Regardless of what mass we're dealing with, it should be true. So shouldn't it also hold for light? So this is how, even in Newtonian physics, we can argue that gravity should affect light, mainly because the acceleration due to gravity is independent of the mass. That means every object should accelerate down at the same rate, and so light should also be accelerated. But I have a problem with this. Okay, here's my counter argument. I'd say, Newton, you remember the force of gravity is given by this expression mg. Well, for light, mass is zero, so the force of gravity is zero. If the force of gravity is zero, then how can there be any acceleration? Acceleration should also be zero, right? And Newton says, Mahesh, be careful, okay? So if you want to calculate acceleration, we have to use Newton's second law, which says this equals ma, and from this, acceleration becomes mg, that is the net force, divided by m. Now, if I substitute mass equal to zero and say that the net force acting, the force of gravity should be zero, then even in the denominator, I get a zero. And a zero by zero, Newton reminds us, is not zero. It's an indeterminate form, which tells us that algebra can't handle it. So that's the important part. Zero by zero is not zero. So how do you calculate it? Well, you need to find better ways to evaluate. And a, good, a better way over here is to just cancel out the masses. And you do indeed find that the acceleration is a constant. It does not depend on the mass and therefore every object should get the same acceleration. This is why the path of the light can be bent by massive stars because light is accelerated towards it by gravity. So the summary over here is because the acceleration due to gravity is independent of mass, light should also be accelerated at the same rate. Now I don't really find this the most intuitive explanation, mainly because this feels like more of a logical extension and less like an elegant answer to it. But what was intriguing for me is the fact that even if the force of gravity, just, by, just because the force of gravity is zero, doesn't mean the acceleration becomes zero because you end up with getting a zero by zero. So being, so this reminds me that we have to be very careful when it comes to equations, especially when we're dealing with zeros. But now this brings us to one of the biggest mysteries that most folks, including Newton, couldn't solve. 
So Newton, what is that? Well, Newton asks Mahesh, can't you see it over here? And I'm like, no, what? I can't see a mystery over here. What is it? Newton says, allow me to explain. So if you look at this equation a little bit more carefully, and if you look at the left-hand side, what is M over here? Well, I say, Newton, M is mass. <laughs> Newton says, no, but what does it signify? Well, M over here signifies how much you feel gravity, how much you feel the force of gravity. If M value is small, then notice the force of gravity is small. But if this M value is big, then the force of gravity would be bigger. So it's a number that tells you how much gravitational force you would feel, right? I'm like, yes. And now Newton says, let's look on the other side. Oh, there's an M here as well. What does M signify here? And I say, well, that's again, mass Newton. <laughs> but Newton says, what does it signify? Well, over here, it signifies how much you resist acceleration, inertia. If you have small M, you have small inertia, very easy to accelerate it. If you have a large M, then you have large inertia, it's much harder to accelerate it. So what you see is that you have two completely different properties over here. One is talking about how much gravity you feel. The other talks about how much inertia you have. And for some very weird reason, they both depend on mass. They both are always equal because they're always equal to the mass. Why is that the case? Again, if I'm being honest, I didn't think too much about it when I was in high school. I just canceled the masses, but it kind of makes sense. You can think of this as gravitational charge, just like how electric charge tells you how much electric force you feel. This number is a gravitational charge that tells you how much gravitational force you feel. But why is this gravitational charge the same thing as inertia? Like, how does that make any sense? So these two properties, these two independent properties, having the same value is almost as weird as, I don't know, maybe having a professional and an amateur using the same tool to build a website. Actually, that's not so weird. We do have a tool like that. It's called Squarespace, the sponsor of this video. To create a website on Squarespace, just click the Create Website button. And now it gives us two options. If you're an amateur like me with no website building experience, then we can directly choose templates. There are a ton of templates to pick from. I chose portfolio for my website and picked the one that I liked. Then comes the good part. These templates are hyper customizable. I clicked buttons to customize images, fonts, embed videos and whatnot. And in a few hours, it does take a few good hours. But in a few hours, floatedphysics.com went live. On the other hand, if you are a professional, unlike me, then you can build your own template. Decide how your homepage would look like, how the other pages would look like, the colors, the fonts, everything. And then you can edit it to perfection. While amateurs, again, like me, can benefit from their on-demand support, professionals, again, unlike me, can benefit from their insane analytics. So anyone can use Squarespace to build awesome websites. If you wanna get started for free, go to www.squarespace.com slash floated physics. And of course, you can use the code floated physics on the checkout to get 10% off on your first purchase. The link is also in the description below. Now, back to that weird thing. So Newton, what's the answer to this? Why are these two completely independent properties having exactly the same value as the mass of that object? And Newton says, I don't know, <laughs> maybe a coincidence or something. And this is where Einstein jumps in and says, Mahesh, there are no coincidences. You got that reference? And I say, welcome back, Einstein, because Einstein is gonna now help us understand this by taking this to a whole new level. How does he do that, you ask? Well, the same thing he always does, you know, thought experiments and then use that to come up with ridiculously sounding conclusions. Yeah, the same thing over here. Okay, Einstein, so what thought experiment is gonna help us understand this? And Einstein says, it's one of his happiest thoughts that he ever had. A man free falling in an elevator to his death. We're not gonna judge. Proceed. So Einstein says, well, if you're in a free falling elevator, then inside the elevator, it feels like you're weightless. You don't feel the weight of anything. Everything feels like they're just floating around, almost as if you are in deep space somewhere where there's absolutely no force acting on you. Einstein wonders, why do we feel like that? Well, now Newton's answer to this is, hey, hey, you're not really weightless. There is a force of gravity acting on you. It's just that you're all falling down at the same rate. So if you think about the elephant, it's accelerating down at 9.8 meters per second square. Now, if this dude was not falling, then that elephant would press on his hand and he would actually feel the weight of the elephant. But because even he is falling down, accelerating down at 9.8 meters per second square, there is no contact force. As a result, 
he doesn't feel the weight of that elephant. He just feels like it's floating over there. The same thing applies to his own body. Therefore, he doesn't feel his own weight. And therefore, everything feels like it's floating over there. But no, they're not really weightless. They do have weight. And Einstein says, well, there must be a more elegant way to answer this instead of just saying that, hey, that's because they're all falling together at the same rate due to some coincidence. Einstein says, what if the reason we all feel like we are weightless, um, it feels like we are stationary in deep space is because maybe we are. <laughs> maybe we are stationary. We are floating in space and not really accelerating. Maybe we are all at rest. And instead of the elevator falling down and everything in the elevator falling down with some coincidence at the same rate, maybe it's just the ground that is accelerating up at 9.8 meters per second square. This sounds ridiculous, but look at what Einstein is trying to say. Einstein is trying to say that maybe there is no such thing as the force of gravity. Maybe gravity is just an illusion, as a lot of people say these days. And my first reaction to this is, this is absolutely ridiculous. You're saying that there is no such thing as gravity, there is no gravitational force, the ground is the one that's accelerating up. What are you saying? And Einstein says, doesn't matter how ridiculous it sounds, the question is, can it explain the observations? And the and Newtonian physics can explain the observations in a very convoluted way, if you think about it. But this can also explain the same observation. We feel weightless because we are weightless. And now at this point, we can say, okay, let's test it out. What happens when you actually fall down once it hits the ground. Let's say the elevator was indestructible. Then in Newtonian model, when the elevator hits the ground, the elevator almost instantly comes to a rest. But these two folks are still moving. And then this person crashes into the elevator and he comes to a rest. And then finally, the elephant crashes into him and then the elephant comes to the rest. And therefore, now they all feel their own weight. What's happening over here, Einstein? Einstein says, well, the exact opposite. Here, it's the elevator, uh, the ground that crashes into the elevator and now starts making the elevator accelerate up. And then the floor of the elevator crashes into his legs and makes him accelerate up. And then he crashes into the elephant, making the elephant accelerate up. And that's why he's pushing the elephant so hard. And therefore the elephant is pushing back Newton's third law and making his life miserable over there. So now we have two models that are trying to explain all the observations that we see when we are close to a massive body, like say the earth. The Newtonian model says that when you are, when we are, at, when we are on the ground, like how you and I are right now, we are at rest. And since gravity is acting on us, it gives us our own weight and we feel that weight. Well, Einstein says, no, 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 you and I are not at rest. Instead, we're all accelerating up at 9.8 meters per second squared. And there is no gravity acting on us. It's, there is no such thing as gravity. It's just that whenever you're accelerating forward, let's say in a bus, just like how you feel a backward inertial jolt, inertial push, which is not a real force. It's just due to inertia, you go backwards. That's the same reason why when we are accelerating up, we feel a downward inertial push. It's not a real push at all. That is what we think is gravity. That's what gives us our weight. It's not gravity, it's just inertial push. And this now explains what happens in free fall. So remember how Newton is looking at this elevator and saying that the reason why everything is falling at the same rate is because of some weird coincidence due to which that whole gravitational charge is the same thing as inertial mass? Well, guess what? Einstein says none of that is happening. In fact, the elevator and everything is at rest. In fact, Newton, you, standing on the ground, you're the one who's accelerating up at 9.8 meters per second square. Silly. That's why for you, it appears as if everything else is falling together at the same rate. Obviously, it'll appear to him that it's falling at the same rate, right? That's the reason why if you actually think that there is a force acting on it due to something called gravity and you invent something called gravitational charge, obviously it'll end up being the same thing as inertia because there is no such thing as gravitational force. So you see, Einstein's model has better explanatory power and it's able to finally give us a conclusion as to why the gravitational charge appears to be the same is the same as inertial mass because there is no such thing as gravity. Gravity is just an inertial push that we experience due to an actual acceleration. But it can now do more than that because this brings us now to our original question as to why gravity bends light. Remember, Newton's answer was very hand wavy. It was a logical extension of everything should follow the same rate, so even light should follow the same rate. But Einstein, can you now do better? Can you bring us home? Let's imagine a flashlight over here. And let's imagine one photon coming out of it and see the path of that photon. We'll start with the Einstein's model. Imagine that 
just right now. Right now, just the floor has hit the elevator and the elevator has just started accelerating. It has not yet started moving, okay? So a photon comes out and it comes out horizontally because the elevator is not yet moving upwards. So if you wait for some time, what'll happen now? Well, that photon will continue moving forward, but the whole elevator and the ground and everything else will start moving upwards. Now, when it moves upwards, it'll not affect the photon because the photon, nothing is pushing the photon up. So if I wait for some more time, the photon will continue moving straight, light moves straight, and this will continue moving up, and this will happen, and look, eventually when it reaches the other side, look, look what's happening. The photon almost reaches the ground, not because anything is pulling it down, there is no gravity, remember, but because the whole thing is accelerating upwards to meet the photon. Now, what does this whole thing look like from the ground's perspective? Well, let's look at it one more time. This is the climax, folks. So again, if we wait for some time, as the photon moved forward, the whole thing moved upwards, right? Therefore, from the elevator's perspective, they don't see themselves going up. Therefore, instead, they will see that photon go, going slightly down. And the same thing continues. They will see the photon going down from their perspective. And that's why from inside the elevator, or the elevator is at rest, remember. So which means if I just switch on the flashlight, the photon has to bend down. This is why gravity affects the path of the photon. This is why light curves down. Not because gravity is pushing, not because gravity is pulling on it and there is some force acting on it. No, 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 because the, there is no gravity. The whole, it's us who is accelerating upwards. So obviously, even if light is massless, you can see it appears to bend down from our perspective. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? But the equivalence principle actually brings more question than it answers. For example, if the path of the light is curved, that means the top of the light travels more distance compared to the bottom in the same time. And that means the speed of light would be different at the top and the bottom. Doesn't that violate Einstein's own special relativity postulate? Does that mean Einstein has actually shot himself in the foot over here? How does he explain this? And what does it even mean to say that the ground is accelerating up? Does that mean that the whole Earth is expanding? And how does this all lead to space-time curvature of general relativity? Stay tuned for the scenes from the next exciting episode of Float Head Physics. Did you get that reference? Always wanted to do that. See you.